Welcome to part four of this week's online lecture. In part four, we will use the information about moments of inertia and reduced mass to discuss the results from the Schrodinger equation we get for the rigid diatomic molecule. In order to set up the Schrodinger equation, we need to know what the Hamiltonian is for my rotating system. And it looks like this. Note that the mass that appeared in the Hamiltonian for the particle in the box has been substituted with the moment of inertia. The del squared term is a second order differential operator commonly referred to as the Laplacian. Using this Hamiltonian and solving the Schrodinger equation will mean that the wave functions will be the rotational wave functions and the energies will be the energies of these rotational states. The form of the Laplacian depends on the coordinate system. For our rigid diatomic system we employed a mathematical transformation so that we could express the system as the reduced mass rotating one bond length away from the origin. We can think of our system as a particle whose mass is the reduced mass moving on the surface of a sphere with a radius equal to the bond length. Well, if this particle is moving on the surface of a sphere, we need two spherical coordinates to describe its position. For example, latitude and longitude. The two coordinates are labelled theta and phi. So the Laplacian is the term in brackets. Admittedly, this equation looks complicated, but in fact you know the solution to this equation. Can you think of a situation in which you have a particle moving around in origin in chemistry? The classic example is an electron moving around the hydrogen nucleus in the hydrogen atom. What are the solutions for hydrogen atom? What are the wave functions? The solutions are atomic orbitals. The atomic orbitals are the product of two components, a radial component and an angular component. Well, in our rigid diatomic, the radius is fixed, so there is no radial component. So the angular components for the atomic orbitals are the solution to this equation. Technically, they're known as spherical harmonics. Note again that this equation is very similar to the equation we would have for linear motion. If it was linear motion, it would have been minus h bar squared over 2m. All I have done to convert it from linear motion to rotational motion is to swap m for i. If we solve this equation, we have to take into account the boundary conditions, which mean we're going to get a quantized system. But why do we have boundary conditions? Well, remember that a wave function must be single valued. Imagine my particle moving around the equator of the sphere. The wave function will be changing as I go round the ring, but when it gets back to its original position, the wave function has to be the same as it was 360 degrees earlier. So that is the boundary condition. The fact that this boundary condition exists means I'm going to get quantization in this system, just like we had for the particle in the box. And the solution leads to these quantized rotational energy levels. J here is my rotational quantum number. Just like n was the quantum number in the particle in the box system. Please note that you do not need to know exactly how solving the Schrodinger equation leads to these rotational energies. All you need to know is that there are boundary conditions and so we have quantization. The units of energy for this expression are joules. The J quantum number can have values of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. So 0 and all positive integers. When j is equal to 0, our expression for the rotational energy tells us that the energy is 0. There is no zero-point energy in this system. If it has zero rotational energy, it means that it is not rotating. 
Is this a problem though? If you know that it is not rotating, you know where it is. Is that breaking the uncertainty principle? The answer is no. Although you know it is not rotating, it is not the position that is important. It is the angular position, and its angular position is unknown. It can be anywhere from zero degrees to infinite degrees. You don't know what angular position it has when it is at rest. The important thing to note with this solution is that for every quantum number j, there is a corresponding wave function and energy level. This is the same as we had for the parking in the box, where for every value of n, there was a corresponding wave function and energy level. The first equation above is in joules. In spectroscopy, we frequently work in units of wave numbers. So let's remember how we convert something in joules into wave numbers. We simply divide through by 100 times hc. Note that here I have replaced the 100 times c by c tilde. c tilde can be considered to be the speed of light in units of centimetres per second rather than metres per second. This is just a convenient abbreviation and I'll be using this abbreviation and this particular notation throughout the rest of this lecture series. I will use the tilde over the C as a shorthand for writing 100 times C. Any time I put a tilde above a parameter, it means that I am using centimetres and not metres. So if I divide through by HC tilde, and I express my H bar as H over 2 pi, this gives this expression here. The energy divided by HC tilde is given the symbol F tilde and is known as the rotational term. I can group the constants together into a constant that is specific for that molecule because it is dependent on the moment of inertia I. Please note that I is calculated using SI units. For the diatomic, the reduced mass is in kilograms and the bond length is in metres. We call that constant the rotational constant and we give it the letter B. We use B tilde because it is in units of wave numbers, centimetres to the minus one. So it is a derived constant, but it is interesting because it depends on the moment of inertia which depends on the reduced mass and the bond length. So if I'm able to determine what the rotational constant is, I'm going to be able to say what the structure of my diatomic is, that is, what is its bond length. So these are the energy levels of the rotational system that come about from solving the Schrodinger equation. However, spectroscopy doesn't tell me what these energy levels are because in spectroscopy we're exciting a molecule from one energy level to another energy level. Absorption will occur if the frequency of the radiation matches the difference in energy between the energy levels. So the question is, what is the difference in energy between two energy levels? Will I be able to compare that to the energy in the spectral lines? So let's have a look at the rotational energy levels that come out of this expression. If I substitute for j equals zero into this expression, my rotational term is equal to zero wave numbers. If I substitute for j equals one, I get 2b. If I substitute for j equals 2, I get 6b. And if I substitute for j equals 3, I get 12b. So these are the energies of each of my rotational energy levels. Note that f is a function of j. What does increasing j really mean? As we can see, when we increase j, we are increasing the rotational energy. As we increase j, we are witnessing our molecule rotating faster. So that is what is going on at the molecular level. What does j equals zero mean? 
when j equals zero, the rotational energy is equal to zero. And yes, indeed, the molecule stops rotating. The other thing that is weird for diatomic molecules is that we only discussed end over end rotation. What about rotation about the internuclear axis? Is that possible? Well, let's think about the moment of inertia for that system. If we consider our atoms as points, which is a good approximation, then clearly the moment of inertia around the internuclear axis is just going to be zero because the atoms lie on the axis and they don't have any size. In reality, of course, the nuclei does have a really small size and of course the electrons are not on the internuclear axis and so the diatomic does have a really small moment of inertia around the internuclear axis. But remember that the rotational term is inversely proportional to the moment of inertia. This means that the j equals 1 rotational state that would be at 2b would be at a very large energy. It would thus take a very large energy to excite a transition between any rotational states. For the idealised diatomic of point atoms, the energy required would be infinite. For this reason, we do not consider transitions between energy levels around the internuclear axis. This is the end of part four of this week's online lecture. Please continue on to part five.